And thanks a lot for inviting me uh, both. It's a pleasure to be here at a conference fully dedicated to Glacier Syndrome. So that's quite an achievement. Uh, like Chitske, briefly introduce myself. I'm, I'm in human genetics in Nijmegen as well, like Chitske. I've been there for uh, much longer, for 30 years, over 30 years already. And um, well, since ever, we have been very much interested, and certainly at the early stages, in the identification of genes or connecting gene uh, changes uh, to disease. And uh, well, this was a major uh, effort, and certainly in the early days, and certainly also for Claesra syndrome, it took a full PhD project uh, to, to achieve that, for, to find EHMT as the culprit in Claesra syndrome. Uh, and, and so it was the case for many other disorders. Nowadays, this is a lot easier. This can be achieved uh, well, in, 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 in weeks rather than, than uh, well, years. And as a consequence, we know by now a lot of monogenic disorders uh, to which gene defects have been connected. And this is an overview, an update, an overview that I made in January. And Chitske mentioned we are already uh, at over 1,600 genes, monogenic genes, connected to rare genetic neurodevelopmental disorders. Now, if we look at the distribution, we can, we can see all types of inheritance patterns, of course, recessive, dominant, X-linked, uh, even mitochondrial. Um, and if we zoom in on the autosomal dominant ones, which is not a majority, but in our society and in clinical care and diagnostics, we see uh, dominant cases uh, as, as a major uh, burden of neurodevelopmental disorders. If you look at those, uh, the vast majority of those are so-called haploinsufficient disorders. So lacking one uh, copy of the gene and remaining one, uh, uh, one normal copy. And I'll come to that in the second part of my presentation where we can take that, uh, that information as an opportunity to gene enhancement of a, a wild type copy of the gene. Well, Claesra syndrome, I'm not going to talk about uh, the clinical presentations. This is not my uh, discipline, um, but, but, but um, well, excellent overviews have been provided by Chitske. Uh, this is an overview by Carleen Vermeulen under supervision of Chitske, showing the distribution of, of symptoms that, uh, that we can appreciate in the many patients that have been analyzed. Um, of course, Claestra syndrome is, is one of many uh, haploinsufficient disorders that are caused by, by defects of a single gene. Claestra syndrome, it's EHMT1, and the causative gene, as you all know, uh, well, is, is an, a regulator of, uh, of methylation. Histone, histone 3 lies in line uh, methylation, mono and dimethylation. And this is considered to be a repressive, oh, we don't see the mouse on my screen. This is considered to be a repressive mark uh, for, uh, for expression. And we know about a lot of other uh, uh, well, genes that are modulators of the grommetin structure uh, that are also underlying neurodevelopmental disorders with overlapping features, of course, but also with feather, very distinct features of, uh, of disease. Now, our interest at the moment is, uh, is not so much anymore to, to identify novel genes for, for uh, rare genetic disorders. We do that just at the site a little bit. But we have moved our research more into, into trying to understand how all these genetic variations lead to disease, give rise to the features that we are observing in, in patients. And also, if with that knowledge at hand, we can try to exploit that knowledge to think about uh, opportunities and, and, and chances for uh, therapeutic interventions. Well, how we do that, uh, our, our research uh, into mechanisms of disease and trying to find opportunities for, develop, uh, for intervention, <laughs> Um, the general strategy is different. We have been using uh, fruit flies uh, together with Annette Schenk uh, as a model organism uh, and, 
to do this, we have also conducted mouse studies to quite a, a large extent. But nowadays, a lot of focus is on the, on the use of human-derived uh, stem cells um, that can be differentiated in a variety of neural lineages that, uh, that can be used for, uh, well, to, for, for investigations. And here we have two advantages as, combined, as, as compared to animal studies. One advantage is that, that we are doing this work in, in a human context, so we can model uh, and we have models of the precise uh, genetic variations that are causative for the disorder in the right genetic context of the disorder. So also the genetic background is, is completely there. And second, we can differentiate these cells in physiologically relevant uh, cell systems and even organoids uh, to do uh, mechanistic uh, studies. So here we see the general strategy and we will hear a lot more about this in, in, in the next uh, days as well. The general strategy to, uh, to take, uh, starting with, with fibroblasts or blood cells from control individuals and patients um, um, to, um, to culture these into induced pluripotent stem cells and then to differentiate these in a variety of, of uh, neural cell lineages, starting with patient cells as well as control cells. But in both cases, we can also genetically modify uh, um, the, the genetic uh, cause. So we can change or introduce in control lineages uh, uh, variants of choice that mimic uh, variants that are causative for the disease. So we have a an isogenic pairs of cells uh, for comparative studies to do our studies, and vice versa. We can start off with patient-derived uh, iPSC cells in which the mutation is being rescued or removed again by CRISPR editing and also to have an isogenic control pair of cells. Now, a number of, uh, of neural lineages uh, can be uh, differentiated. Uh, this is all done in the lab of, of my colleague here in the room, uh, Neil Nadev Kasri, and he will talk more about that. Uh, but most of the studies uh, that I will be talking about, at least, are nowadays done with glutamergic uh, excitatory neurons. Well, these neurons are, are, are differentiated in, uh, and, and can be obtained as a homogeneous um, um, culture uh, that can, in addition, be grown on smart dishes, uh, multi-electrode arrays. And after a few days or after weeks of differentiation, actually, a stable network is, uh, is, is being formed uh, between the neurons, neurons that have been differentiated and, and this neural network is showing uh, also a, a co-connectivity uh, and starts to communicate uh, uh, in a dish. And this can be me measured in this smart dish. It's a multi-electrode array by the electrodes that are at the bottom of these uh, plates. Now, how does it look like? Here is one type uh, on the left. Uh, side, uh, one type of microelectrode arrays, uh, I think in this case with 64 electrodes, uh, by in which the cells are cultured. This is in the left uh, uh, bottom uh, image where you can see the cells in the vicinity of the microelectrode arrays. And spontaneous activity after several weeks in culture can be measured, which can be seen in this graph as, as single spikes in single electrodes, but all of a sudden we see a bursting event of, uh, of, of, um, of activity. Here is one uh, popping up uh, of a range of spike, a train of spikes, all at the same time at all the electrodes in the, in the dish in which the cells are cultures. These are called a network burst, and this is typical of a, of, a, yeah, of, a, of a communication in the entire network that has been formed in the, in the dishes. Um, so this is it. Um, now, we, we, you can do these measurements on all the neurons derived from the different cell types. And if, if this is done on control, uh, on a variety of control lines, uh, you can uh, 
visualize this typical pattern of uh, spiking and bursting events. On top, we see the control um, pattern. And this is a very stereotypical pattern of network bursts that occur uh, across the entire plate at regular intervals and, and also of a regular duration. Um, and this is seen for, yeah, it, it's a stereotypic behavior. The same can be done now for neurons that are derived from a variety of cultured uh, cells derived from patients or CRISPR edited uh, um, um, iPSCs. And here, um, well, for Kleefstra syndrome, we see uh, also a pattern occurring of spiking and bursting, but there is certainly a difference with a pattern that we can observe for control uh, neurons. And that is that in, in all cases, the duration of the network burst is longer. So they are clearly much longer than, than those of the network burst in control lines. The frequency of those network bursts is lower. And also the, the intervals are, are more irregular as, uh, as what we see for uh, control lines. And all of this is indicative of a reduced network uh, um, organization. So here again, for Kleefstra syndrome, we see a stereotypical pattern of an abnormal network. Regardless of the type of mutation that has been tested, and here this, this was done for uh, three different uh, mutations, but um, yeah, but, but uh, by now we have also data of more uh, patients and also CRISPR uh, mutations introduced by CRISPR that showed a very similar pattern. Now, this stereotypic mutant pattern is of interest because we can try and start to understand what, what the underlying uh, disruptions are that cause this irregular pattern. And this is work uh, by Monica Frega, again, in the group of, uh, of Neil Nadev Kasri, uh, who has done this. So looking, uh, in particular, focusing on the, uh, the, the extended duration of the network bursts um, observed in Kleefstra syndrome lines. And the, the well, the, the logical explanation or one explanation uh, that, that one can think about, about for the increased duration of these network bursts is that, um, that synaptic um, um, receptors are increased or deregulated at least in their occurrence at the synaptic uh, surface. So uh, physiological investigations were done to see if NMDA and MPA receptors were indeed differently expressed at the surface of the, of the synapses of Kleefstra syndrome neurons. And it turned out that whereas the MPA receptor appearance on the surface was not so much different as compared to control neurons, uh, there appeared to be an increased uh, activity of NMDA receptors of, uh, of uh, Kleefstra syndrome synapses. And this is shown in this slide. Further, if you then look into the mechanisms why, by which this NMDA receptor activity could be increased, you can look at expression levels uh, of, of genes or targeted or, or uh, transcriptome-wide look at transcription, and it turned out that there was an increased transcription and translation of one of the subunits of the NMDA receptor, the NR1 subunit encoded by the GRIN1 gene. And this is indicated here. This is an image of a Westrom blot where it's very clearly visible that the expression of this subunit is increased as compared to the normal situation. So it's a higher expression. Not only that, uh, um, also the analysis of the epigenetic um, signature uh, at or, and around the GRIN1 gene was investigated by looking at the H3K9 methylation, the activity that is controlled by uh, EH71. And in that case, it was observed that, uh, that this H3K9 dimethylation pattern was indeed decreased as expected in cells from patients, which is well almost a logical explanation for the increased expression of GRIN1 at this locus. So increased NMDA1 activity 
Then the next and final experiment done with these cells was, well, if this is the case, if, if an increase of, is observed, can we modulate um, that, um, that, in, that activity oops, by uh, NMDA receptor antagonists like MK801? And indeed, this turned out to be the case. So this was a compound that more or less was able to normalize uh, the uh, network uh, 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 duration activity. Now, um, another tool by, for which, uh, which these cells can be used is, well, is, is to see not only for looking into mechanisms of disease, but the interesting observation is that it's a very stereotypic altered network burst uh, duration and activity. And, and ever so often in diagnostic, we are confronted with the question whether a variant observed in a gene is causative for a phenotype or not. Um, so very often um, in, in diagnostic, uh, gene uh, diagnostics, but also in clinical genetics, we are confronted with so-called variants of unknown significance identified in a candidate gene like EHFD1, but for which it's not very clear whether or not it's causative for the phenotype. Now this question could perhaps be tackled by using uh, these iPSC-derived neurons from patients um, by just looking if, if this specific variant would give rise to a pattern of, of uh, microelectrode activity that is reminiscent of the aberrant pattern activity of other Kleefstra syndrome patients. Now here's an example of, of one variant that was identified uh, in, a, in a case with a neurodevelopmental disorder, overlapping features of Kleefstra syndrome, but not convincingly. And in this case, it was a synonymous uh, variant uh, in, in one of the exons, but an exon at the boundary of a splice site. So a silent variant, but also a variant that had an effect on splicing. Well, this splicing effect was verified by uh, RT-PCR, and indeed abnormal splicing events could be, uh, could be observed that indicated that this variant led to the uh, exclusion of the exon uh, that was at the splice site. And this was an, uh, leading to this exon exclusion to an in-frame deletion. So not nonsense mediated RNA decay, but an in-frame deletion that gave rise to a protein that had an internal deletion of a range of amino acids. Of, I don't know the number here, 16 amino acids, I think. Any case, so then the, again, the pattern of these Kleefstra syndrome cells was identified. And whereas uh, cells from canonical Kleefstra syndrome patients gave rise to increased duration of the network burst, this was not the case in, in this line. So um, um, neurons derived from this individual with a silent variant gave rise to, uh, yeah, to, to a burst duration that was not so much different uh, from the duration in control individuals. Other question you could ask then, well, if, this, if, if NMDA receptor antagonists are able to normalize uh, the network burst duration in Kleefstra syndrome neurons, um, is this also then possible to see a sort of normalization in, in neurons from the patients? Well, there is no uh, well, no aberration to start off with, but here we either of neither do see any effect of this NMDA receptor antagonist on those cells. So clearly in this patient, something else is ongoing. There is a variant in EHMT1. There's an effect at the RNA level uh, on, on the EHMT1 transcript in this patient, but it's not giving rise to the typical haploinsufficiency defect that we observe for Kleefstra syndrome patients. So something else is going on here. Now, about this something else and about the mechanisms of disease, we will hear a lot more in the uh, tomorrow. Uh, the interpretation of versus and variants is a presentation by Dmitry Rots in the audience over here. 
and mechanisms of disease by using these induced pluripotent stem cell derived neurons will be, will be presented by Neil Nadif Kasri. I just would like to, to finish my presentation or the second half of my presentation uh, with some, uh, some strategies that we are thinking about to use iPSC derived neurons for, uh, for trying to find, uh, well, let's say, uh, targets for intervention. And uh, well, this is something we actually already started a while ago. This is uh, an experiment, one of the initial experiments that, uh, that we have conducted and where we have uh, used and screened a very small library of compounds that had one or another effect on, on, on uh, proteins that are involved in gromatin modulation. So these are methylase inhibitors, demethylase inhibitors, uh, acetylase inhibitors, etc. Now, a library of such compounds was, was tested on two uh, Clefstra syndrome derived neuron lines as compared to, of course, control lines. And there again, we looked at, at, the, uh, at, the, uh, at the patterns of the microelectrode arrays that were generated. In particular, again, as a robust parameter, the duration of the network burst. And in this experiment, there was indeed one, uh, one compound indicated in green here and box with red that did seem uh, to have an effect in normalizing the mutant pattern of MIA activity towards a pattern that is more reminiscent of the control uh, cell line. Now, we have not followed up on, the, on this specific compound. Uh, there were uh, several arguments that made it not a very Candidate, good candidate to further research, but at least this would be a strategy that, uh, that, that can be used to screen larger libraries or candidate compounds for having an effect on, uh, on well, synaptic activity, network activity of patient-derived cells. And we think that this, is, well, this strategy is, uh, is powerful. You can use small molecules, you can use FDA-approved compound libraries or libraries of chromatin modifier compounds as we did in our initial screen. And eventually this would, would possibly lead to the identification of compounds that can have an effect on, uh, on, 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 well, at least on the network activity. What that would mean to the patient, of course, is absolutely unclear. Huh? That this could be a treatment uh, for some features and for some symptoms that are observed in patients, but how eventually this would have an effect on phenotypes that are being observed, fortunately, we don't know. Um, another strategy that we and others are following is the upregulation of, of the gene. And this is particularly useful, of course, for haploinsufficient genes where still the normal copy is present and, and the abnormal copy, copy is, uh, well, is not functional. And this could be a strategy uh, also for treatment of, of symptoms that occur at postnatal stages. Um, well, haploinsufficiency is probably not what I need to explain here for this audience. But uh, well, as compared to the, to the controls, controls, the haploinsufficiency can be due to, to several reasons. It can be due to a reduced transcription because of a deletion, for example, um, or because of a point mutation, we can see reduced amounts of transcripts because of non-sus-mediated decay of the mutant transcripts. And eventually, there can also be well, a loss of, of mutant proteins that, uh, that are unstable. So there are different uh, ways that could lead to the, to the haploinsufficiency. So are there different uh, strategies that one can consider uh, to use uh, for upregulation of the amount of EHMT protein? So that's, what it all, uh, that, that's all what is important, of course. And one uh, approach that we have been considering and, and been exploring to, to, to a limited extent is to use to modulate translation with a technique that's called synapse. And synapse is, is a technique that, uh, by which a, a target is being developed 
that can bind to, to our gene of interest, the EHMT1 gene, and by that recruit factors that are important for translation. Um, so, and, and these, well, these are uh, sign B2 elements. It's in the effector domain that's cobbled to a binding domain that, that would bind to the promoter sequence of transcripts and by that recruit uh, translation factors more efficiently as to in, induce uh, protein synthesis. Now, in theory, this is a relative easy deliverable, easy, easy by viral trans, transfections, infections, or even as RNA molecules. The dosage is, is also relatively uh, controlled. So here we don't see hugely expressed, uh, um, um, overexpressed uh, um, um, expression of, of the gene of interest or overaccumulation of the protein. But the huge difficulty that, that, uh, that we experience in, in setting up these experiments is actually the selection of effective binding sites. So it's not as, as straightforward as it seems to identify the right binding site molecules that, that can be used in an experiment like this. Well, many other techniques can be, uh, can, can be considered. One is, of course, upregulation by introducing exogenous copies of your gene of interest, in this case, EHMT1, either as a viral construct or as, as a nanoparticle. Um, and even in, 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 well, in, in a combination with cell therapy, one can consider to do this. Um, and well, there, there are good opportunities for delivery of all these constructs, but the disadvantage of these technologies is actually the accurate dosage that can be obtained. So the calibration of the expression that you would be considering is, is very difficult. Uh, and, and well, what one also would like to avoid is overexpression of a gene of interest because it could also lead to, uh, to well, symptoms that are disadvantages to the disadvantages to the individual. Also possible off-target effects uh, can be a disadvantage. CRISPR, of course, everybody is talking about CRISPR these days. Well, CRISPR editing is, is not something that, uh, that is generally and easily approved in, 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 in uh, clinical studies. Um, what is, is possible to consider is to use CRISPR analogs, the so-called dead CRISPR molecules, that are not introducing double-strand DNA breaks that are a risk for off-target effects. So one could uh, um, consider to use inactive CRISPR uh, molecules that can be targeted to your gene of interest and be coupled to an activator, so to enhance the expression of the gene of interest. So this is an opportunity uh, that, uh, that we are thinking to, uh, to pursue. Um, but also here, there's always the, the risk of off-target effects. But finally, uh, we can zoom in on the gene itself and see if we can regulate the normal regulators of our gene of interest, EHMT1. And as for any gene, there are always uh, quite a, well, a range of different um, ways which, are, which the, well, nature has invented to accurately uh, well, control the expression level of genes. And these control elements in turn can also be well, taken as a, as a target for intervention also for uh, therapeutic strategies. And this is what we can think about. We can try to modulate antisense RNAs or long non-coding RNA molecules. Mm -hmm. um, as indicated here, we see here's a screenshot in this graph in blue of the EHMT1 gene taken from the UCSC browser. And there are several, well, not antisense RNAs, but uh, there's antisense RNAs uh, close to the promoter of EHMT1, and there are also overlapping long non-coding RNA molecules that might also interfere with expression of EHMT1. And these can be targeted. Uh, and microRNAs, well, here's one that is, is close to the uh, three prime end of EHMT1, so also that could be a, a target for modulation. 
upstream uh, open reading frames are also control elements occurring in a large majority of, no, not a majority, that's wrong, almost half of the genes um, have upstream open reading frames that can either act as stimulators or, um, or uh, repressors of transcription. I've been unable to identify those for EH71, but what we can observe uh, within the coding sequence of, uh, of EH71 itself, that there are open reading frames uh, that, and even ups, uh, coding open re reading frames that can interfere with the transcription of uh, EH71 itself. Well, and finally, well, one approach that has been used for, for, well, for Dravet syndrome, for example, is to reduce non-productive splicing by, by just taking out uh, exons that are, are interfering with the production of an active EHMT1 protein molecule. Unfortunately, I've been unable so far to identify, uh, well, um, non-productive splicing or non-productive exons that could be targeted by that. So in general, my conclusion of this is that, that, well, and we will hear more about the strategies tomorrow actually in talks by Roman Gerala and Mojka Romsina. Um, the, the advantage of these techniques is that delivery, delivery is possible and relatively well, easy perhaps if we target these, the gene with RNA molecules. Um, the accurate dosage is, is another question. This could be more complicated. But the main question is, what are the, uh, the, the negative regulators? Can we indeed identify these regulators? And not only that, can we figure out how they work and how they can be modulated as to, uh, to modulate the expression of EHMT1 itself? And this is the work that, uh, that we are currently doing. So we are analyzing uh, the activity of the various non-coding and coding transcripts in the vicinity of EHMT1 or at EHMT1 and see how they are expressed in relation to expression of EHMT1 itself to figure out how we can use them as a target for, uh, for modulating EHMT1 expression. I'm finished here. Thanks a lot for your attention. There's a lot of names <laughs> to, to mention. Uh, the work has been done uh, uh, with the PIs uh, listed at top, Neil Nadev Kastri and Chiske Kleefstra, of course, also Derek Schubert and many uh, enthusiastic people in the group. Thanks a lot.